Welcome to MTN Outdoors. Hi there and welcome to this week's episode of MTN Outdoors. I'm John Riley and I'll be your guide for this brand new episode. And as you might see, we are not outdoors right now. We're indoors because it's a last chance stampede. I'm actually here with Corbin, who's been working on a steer project for 4-H. Uh, Corbin, so can you tell me a little bit about your steer? Um, yeah, he's my, he's my grandpa's steer. He's been, I bought it from him back in November and he's been, he's been born in about March of 2023. He's been doing really well, even for not me working on him that much, but he's been doing super well and looks really good in my opinion. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but Angus? Yes, Black Angus. And uh, what type of you know work goes into the genetics and the breeding for for you know your steer and just cattle in general? Um, your breeding is mostly you want a very good marbled uh, cut of beef, and you want it you want them to have a lot of beef or a lot of steaks on them and all that stuff. But the main thing that I've found is you need them to be gentle. If they're not gentle, they're going to be stressed and they're not going to marble or gain at all and you're not gonna have a very well performing steer. And that's one of the biggest things that I've found. What's been your favorite part of doing 4-H? Um, the favorite part's definitely been meeting the people, the communication st skills and all that stuff. And I mean, the, the fair is one of the best parts. You get to go away from home a little bit and kind of camp out and have a, have a good time, be with, be with friends and you get to show, show off what, you've, um, what product you've made and other than that, I think, I mean, that's, I think, in my opinion, the best part. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Corbin. Best of luck with your project. Hope it does well. And critical thinking is a big part of 4-H and agriculture in general, which is why we're headed over to Tim McGonigal, who took a look at a farmer who's actually growing a greenhouse underground. Big Sandy farmer Bob Quinn is one of the world's foremost experts in organic farming. He's the man who brought us Cracklin Kamut and most recently opened up the Quinn Institute, a 700 acre regenerative organic research project. And before that, he built a subterranean greenhouse. What I'm trying to do on my farm is grow everything I eat and eat everything I grow. Organic farmer Bob Quinn had the idea for a subterranean greenhouse a decade ago. And it took root when he saw an ad through a Nebraska company called Greenhouse in the Snow. I went to visit them and they showed me oranges and lemons and grapefruit and all this stuff in Nebraska and I said I've got to have this. With the help of other farmers it took about two years to build the 17 by 90 foot cement walled structure. In, in Nebraska they go down four feet but they suggested I go down eight feet here for, for further north. The geothermal controlled right. greenhouse features about 300 feet of four inch pipe 10 feet underground to help regulate airflow. All year long is 50 degrees so in the winter it's providing a little heat and the summer is providing a little cooling. In the winter, that feels warm, right? but today it feels nice and cool. The greenhouse is divided into two sections. The first under two feet of topsoil and compost. This room is 60 feet long, and this is my citrus room. We call it my orange room. So in here is all my citrus. I have a lemons and limes and grapefruits and pomelos, and I have some bananas in the middle. Um, I've got a fig tree right here in the end. Next door is the stone fruit room, under three feet of topsoil. So we have peaches. I have a sweet cherries, I have plums. The greenhouse has had its share of challenges. Well, in April, we had the electricity went off for 30 hours, all the fans quit, so I didn't have, and I was gone, I didn't have any way uh, to cool this. And during a 40 below stretch in the winter, the inside temperature dropped enough to put a temporary halt to his banana growing venture. They, they, they really got cooked this winter and had to start over. So all those bananas came up from the ground um, uh, since January. And while the sizzling heat of a Montana summer can send the temperatures soaring. It's just over 100, 100, almost 110, my gosh. Bob loves the thought of being a snowbird without leaving Big Sky Country. Um, so a lot of people, my grandparents, my parents, even my sister, uh, used to go to Arizona for the winter. But my wife wasn't really interested in going to Arizona for the winter, so I decided to bring a little Arizona to me. Southeast and of Big Sandy, Tim McGonigal, MTN News. There's nothing quite like it. There's nothing quite like being on, on the back of an animal and really you're putting your well-being in their hands. The back of an animal with his own brain. You've got to trust that animal and that relationship and uh, trust them to take care of you out there. The infamous event at Rebecca Farm is this weekend bringing equestrian riders to the Flathead from across the country. 
the competition is really second to none. Um, there's only maybe one other competition that can compare, and that's our national five-star championship in Lexington, Kentucky. And so we're very fortunate to have this place um, to bring all of our horses, not just our top horses, but our up-and-coming horses to a venue like this, and it's world-class. The event is an Olympic qualifier and one of the only events in the West of its caliber. 630 horses will ride at Rebecca Farm this weekend, including some horses and riders who have competed in the Olympics. We bring in everybody from greenies to experienced, and one of the great things about eventing is you're all kind of on the same stage at the same time. So, you know, I may be out there warming up and, and oh, look, but next to me is Philip Dutton, who's ridden for the Olympic team, you know, or or whomever it might be. So I think that's really cool as far as this sport is that we combine both amateurs and professionals um, and, and it's a sport that welcomes both. But the event is more than just an equestrian Ooh. competition and is a huge fundraiser for breast cancer to honor the creator of the event, Rebecca Broussard, who lost her life to breast cancer. I never thought, you know, when I came up with this harebrained idea 11 years ago, I never thought that I'd be saying, yeah, we've raised a million dollars. and. We've helped a lot of uh, research programs, and we've helped a lot of local programs here for those dealing with cancer currently. The Broussard family also gives developing rider grants to competitors who need a leg up to get to the next level. One recipient of these grants, Tammy Smith, is ranked number five in the world as of 2023 and is part of the Olympic team. And a feeling of that people believe in you makes you feel like you really can do it because I think Self-doubt is a huge thing, even with professionals, we have that. It made me, it, it was almost like confirmation that I really could do it. It was really career changing. Um, I owe it to this family for uh, what they did for me because they ultimately put the belief in me to help make my dreams come true. While there are some incredible professional athletes at this event, it is for riders of all levels who come to compete at a world-class facility. Everybody loves it here because it's happy, you know? I mean, we, we create smiles and, you know, that's fantastic. Uh, I love to see people enjoying what they're doing and I really enjoy seeing that and being able to be part of the stepping stone ladder to get to the next level for each of these riders. The event at Rebecca Farm goes through Saturday and is free for spectators to enjoy. In Kalispell, Kiana Wilson, MTN News. Hay is essential to farmers and ranchers all over the U.S. And with these continuing high temperatures, will the water last for a second or third cutting of hay this year? It was, it was kind of a slow spring. We had a cool spring and the hay didn't green up. It was real slow taking off, so that's kind of what hurt some of our tonnage this year. But yeah, it's, it's, it's coming along, but it's, just, it's time to get it cut now. It's drying up fast and it's time to get it cut and start over again. Even though there's some good hay left from last year, will this year's cut be able to last till next year? Will we run out of water? Hopefully we'll have another two and a half weeks. And usually, you know, hay needs water late in the year and we just won't have it. And so the um, second cutting of hay, alfalfa, grass, whatever it will be, is going to be a short cut. They're just, uh, it's high consumption crop of water and we just don't have it. Oh yeah, they're, you know, they're concerned, you know, winter wheat's gonna be tough to get in, and there again, the, the, the alfalfa and the, and the grass, you know, that we need for grazing. And, uh, you know, uh, we supply groundwater. So your wells, the stock water that runs in our ditches, you know, that, that's gonna be short. So it, it has quite a, an effect. When this goes dry, a lot of things go dry. As farmers and ranchers continue to water their fields and pray for rain, this year's water allowance is coming to an end. In Fairfield, I'm Paul Sanchez for MTN News. Well, the Montana extreme heat doesn't just affect humans. It affects the animals here at the last chance stampede as well. I'm going to take a deep dive into how these animals are cared for during temperatures that exceed 100 degrees. It is very hard to care for livestock in general. But when adding extreme weather to the mix, the 4-H members participating in this year's events at the Last Chance Stampede 
must consider new challenges. Making sure their water is always clean, making sure it's cool, and making sure that they are washed up most times that they are getting hot. Other individuals I spoke with added that they altered the feeding times of their cattle to cooler parts of the day, like early in the morning or late at night, to reduce overall stress and improve health by limiting their caloric intake. Reporting in Helena, meteorologist Joey Bianconi, MTN News. Coming up after the break, we learn more about hoot owl restrictions across the state, and we see how researchers are tracking forever chemicals through turtle populations, which brings us to our trivia. Do you know how many species of turtles live in Big Sky Country natively? That answer coming up after the break. We now return to MTN Outdoors. Welcome back. So do you know how many species of turtles natively live in Montana? From the painted turtle to the snapping turtle and the spiny soft shell, there are only three native species of turtles in Montana. Things are still bustling down here at the Last Chance Stampede, and I'm here with some of the greatest of all time. Now, researchers are concerned about PFAS, or forever chemicals, being found in our waterways. And some researchers in Yellowstone County are using turtle populations to gain a better understanding. When you think about the Yellowstone River, boating, floating, and fishing may all be things that come to mind. But for one group, it's the turtles in this river that they look out for. Because they're at the top of the food chain, they're a good indicator of what's happening in that ecosystem. As the iconic Yellowstone River flows through Billings, spiny softshell turtles lurk below, collecting whatever may be in the water. PFAS contaminants are they're called forever chemicals is another word for them. Recent Montana Department of Environmental Quality surveys identified the Yellowstone having elevated levels of PFAS and a need for more monitoring to be done. We eat the fish out of this river, we, our drinking water comes from this river, right? That's where Rocky Mountain College professor Kahan Ostevar and his students come in. Our goal is to use an organism that's long lived in the river it's kind of sampling the river all the time for us again as a way, as a biosentinel to assess the PFAS contaminants. Yeah, I pull on zero. Trapping, weighing, tagging. Ostevar has years of experience handling thousands of turtles in the area. For this new study, they've brought along a makeshift onshore lab. If we take their blood, we can assess what's in the water by sampling their blood. And that's what this study is looking at. Occasionally in their traps, they find a surprise worth gathering data on. Oh! A 46 pound snapping turtle, the biggest they've ever caught. I've always been fascinated by reptiles because they're, they're really understudied everywhere. So this is, nobody's ever studied snapping turtles in Montana. Old creatures in our waters carrying vital information. In Billings, Haley Monaco, MTN News. The above average heat of the last few weeks has been hard on all of us, and that includes the fish of Montana's waterways. That's why the Montana Department of Fish, Wildlife and Parks has put hoot owl restrictions on some of Montana's rivers. Hoot owl restrictions uh, are designed to protect fish during the hottest times of the day. Uh, they prohibit fishing between 2 p.m. and midnight each day. So it still allows people to go fishing uh, during the cool times of the day when, when conditions are a little bit better for fish, while still protecting fish uh, during the, the hottest and most stressful times of the day. Remember, these fish live year-round in these waters. That means they like it cold. As summer wears on, water's warm and the fish struggle. The water temperatures get into that 70 degree uh, range and above. Uh, that's really when when trout struggle, uh, especially after being caught and released. And so uh, the hoot owl restrictions are a good way to, to sort of compromise to to continue to allow fishing opportunity uh, while still protecting trout during the most difficult and stressful times of the day. Jacobson encourages anglers to use care when fishing in the summer. Even if the river you're fishing doesn't have a hoot owl, the fish are still fighting the heat just like the rest of us. Uh, and so when, when you are out fishing, uh, regardless of what time of day it is, uh, make sure that you're taking precautions to make that process easier for fish when you catch and release fish. Uh, so that includes keeping the fish in the water, uh, keep your hands wet when you're handling fish, uh, and then you know, minimizing the, the stress for fish. So you know, 
bringing the fish in and, and releasing it as quickly as possible. Now it's important to note that hoot owl restrictions can change quickly based on river flows and temperatures. That's why Jacobson says his best piece of advice is to check the FWP website before you head out for any afternoon of fishing on any of Montana's rivers. On the Madison River, Chet Lehman, MTN News. Montana may be known for animals like bear and moose, but on World Snake Day, Montana Wild is shedding light on some other animals that call it home. I came out because I heard that you get to touch a snake and you would, and we would get to learn more about them. And I, I really like snakes. I would like, I would like a corn snake as a pet. 11 year old Serena Light was one of roughly 30 people attending snake days at Montana Wild. I think people are normally scared by them and try to kill them, but the snakes are, like spider snakes, are actually more scared of you than you are of them. According to Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, Montana has 10 native snake species, with only one being venomous, the prairie rattlesnake. FWP says that people are most likely to see gardener snakes when outdoors, while the least common native snakes are western milk snakes, plains hognose snakes, and smooth green snakes, because they are all species of concern. FWP says they are not classified as endangered, but these species are considered at risk and the concern is for the future of the species in the state of Montana and not necessarily to the future of the species nationally. We want to be able to keep the snakes here. They're all eating different animals that help control those pests because we don't want mice in our house. Montana Wild Snakes of Montana presentation looked at what makes a snake a snake and the differences between reptiles and amphibians. Since Montana sees sub-zero temperatures over the winter, the presentation also discussed how snakes survive the challenging weather. Rattlesnakes, gopher snakes, and sometimes North American racers will all hibernate together, and they hibernate to stay warm. Um, that way they don't freeze. Depending on how warm it is out, they'll all come out in ma a mass horde, and it'll kind of look like the ground's moving, but it happens within minutes. So if you come across one, uh, you're either really lucky or unlucky, depending on how much you like snakes. Even though some people fear snakes, education can bring respect for these important animals. We grow up kind of in a society where people are afraid of snakes, so having the education aspect is really important. That's the best way to respect and be able to understand them better and understand why they're important to the ecosystem and the environment. FWP says that other than professionals, people should avoid getting near all wild snakes and other animals. For more information about Montana snakes, visit our website. In Helena, I'm Allie Kaiser, MTN News. Coming up after the break, a vehicle with five passengers drove into a Yellowstone thermal feature, and we head to a biker rally on the Beartooth. We now return to MTN Outdoors. I know, it's always a bad idea to disrupt national parks and some of the greatest outdoors places that we have. But recently, a bunch of rescuers had to remove a vehicle from a thermal feature in Yellowstone National Park. I agree, very bad idea to drive into that. But Haley Monaco has more. It was a large group effort to recover the vehicle that drove into the thermal pool in Yellowstone National Park last week, and people from right here in Billings were heavily involved. Visitors from all over the world come to enjoy the wonders of Yellowstone. The sounds and the sights drawing millions. But last week, it wasn't nature or sightseeing that brought a team from Hanser's Automotive to Yellowstone. It was a very unusual and very memorable assignment. I mean, I, I would say even from our standpoint, that's pretty unique. A vehicle plunged into the semi-centennial geyser near Roaring Mountain with five tourists inside. This is the first time we've um, experienced uh, any operation like this um, in a geyser. The vehicle was fully submerged in nine feet of water. All five people inside swam through the 105 degree water to safety after sustaining only minor injuries. By Friday morning, Hansers and the U.S. Water Rescue Dive Team were working hand in hand with the park to get the vehicle out. From our standpoint, it's, you know, mobilizing the specialty equipment and straps and all the rigging that go along with that. As Hansers was above the water, controlling traffic and getting ready to safely pull the vehicle out, the dive team was going into the acidic hot water, making for an interesting recovery story. Normally, especially in Montana, we're dealing with um, cold waters. The dry suit uh, keeps the water 
and any contamin contaminants totally away from, from the diver. A recovery unlike any other. Glad everybody was there. In Billings, Haley Monaco, MTN News. Riding your brake, riding your clutch, just trying to just fighting the gravity, just the whole thing. Just about falling over and getting back up. Three decades of mouthfuls of dust and pockets full of sweat have torn through the heat for this side of Red Lodge to show out today. Bone Daddy's Beartooth Rally is a three-day communal celebration of family found during that two-wheeled search for isolation. A very close friend of ours uh, has passed away in this last year, and so we were just kind of reminiscing of all the great times that we've had here. We still can't believe he's gone. While you might expect tattooed dudes with biker beards. You're going to find different breeds of a lot of different people out here, man. Big, small, little, doesn't matter. We're going to we're gonna have some fun today. 18-year-old Sailor Bell races her iron horse right alongside Twitch, the dirt pirate veteran. I get really anxious. Like the first time I went out there, I couldn't even feel my hands because I was just so excited. Racing in the rally for the last four years, Sailor says she feels right at home. When you all come together and you're here, it's just like a giant family. Everyone's so nice. Looking up to those around her. Get your kids interested in motorcycles. They won't have time for drugs. She hopes to spend her life investing in the hunt for the razor's edge. You think bikers are just like all big and fat, but they're like the nicest people out there. Marcus Kukova, MTN News. The Horse Gulch Fire is the biggest wildfire in Montana so far this year. In its first few days, tremendous growth occurred as the fire ripped through very dry fuels. But over the last several days, the fire has been burning in higher elevations where fuels are not quite as dry just yet. From when the fire was discovered to three days after, the fire grew around 10,000 acres. Fuels were very dry in the lower elevations. Firefighters reported water drops by helicopters and planes were not effective as thousand hour fuels doused by water we're back engulfed in flames within one minute. The fire has slowed somewhat in recent days because of firefighting efforts, but also the fire has burned into higher elevations where fuels have had more moisture. But these fuels in mid and upper elevations are beginning to cure. Fuel moisture in 110 hour fuels is very low. This fuel combined with near cured grasses is the primary carrier of the fire. There is also a significant dead and downed component carrying fire on north slopes that would normally burn slower because of more moisture. And now you're a little more weatherwise. Well, that's going to just about do it for this week's episode of MTN Outdoors. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you to all of the members of Lewis and Clark County 4-H for hosting us for this episode. Now, before we go, I've got some important questions to ask these chickens. Which came first, chicken or the egg? Why did you cross the road? <laughs>